So today we're going to remember our Savior and His sacrifice. That's what this is all about. Remembering what He endured for us, and we're going to worship our Savior for the salvation that He provides. Salvation is found in nobody else except the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation means I'm being saved from the consequences of my sin. He's the only one that can do it. And he's done all that's necessary when he died on the cross and rose from the grave. So we're going to be looking at that this morning. In order to understand it, we want to share with you the gospel truth. And I would suggest you take notes on these scriptures. Some of you may already have these memorized. I don't know if you do or don't. But the very first part of the gospel truth that you need to get down is that you and I are sinners. You and I have broken God's commandments. We have done things that He does not approve of, and that's called sin. You and I are all sinners, and we're deserving death and hell. You say, well, I don't like the sound of that. Good. Don't want you to like the sound of it. Because if you like the sound of it, you say, okay, so what? It I'm, I'm, doesn't bother me. I'm going to keep on going until I die and can burn in hell. It doesn't have to be that way for you. But know the truth. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. That tells us that in Romans 3, 23. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We, we don't match up to His perfect holiness. And so therefore, we're not qualified for heaven. We're imperfect. And it tells us in Romans 6, 23, that the wages or the price tag for our sin, and we're all sinners, is death. We understand about death. Most of us have been to a funeral or two. We understand about death. We know that sooner or later we're all going to die. Why did that? Why, why aren't Adam and Eve still alive? Sin. Sin is deadly. It kills us all. But there's a second death that the Bible talks about in the book of Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. And we, again, we don't have time to read that whole verse of Scripture. But I, I said 21, verse 20. I'm sorry. That is 20. Go to 21 if you wouldn't mind. That was my mistake. You can turn in your Bible if you want to. Better to read it out of your Bible than just let the preacher misdirect you. Chapter 21 and verse 8 says, The fearful and unbelieving, those that are not putting their faith and trust in Jesus, unbelievers, say, I don't believe that. The abominable, that's horrible, mean, ugly, terrible people. And murderers, we understand about murderers and whoremongers, that's immoral people. And sorcerers, people that are involved in the occult, and idolaters, people that worship idols, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burn with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You say, well, I'm not a murderer, and I'm not a sorcerer, I'm not a whoremonger, I'm not any of those things, but wait a minute, if I'm a liar that says I've earned the second death? And the answer is yes, the second death is being cast into the lake of fire. It's very true, and it's very real. And so we need to go back to that statement we looked at a moment ago. You and I are sinners deserving death and hell. God said so. It's just that plain. That's the bad news. But you see, the gospel means the good news. And the good news is that in spite of that truth, God loves us. Some of you parents say, boy, my children, if they'd have just obeyed me perfectly, but they didn't, do you still love them? Yeah, you do. That's the way it is with God and us. He loves us in spite of the fact that we have not obeyed Him perfectly. We are sinners. He has loved us. He does love us. He eternally loves us. And it's the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the whole world that He gave His only begotten Son. That's Jesus. That whosoever believeth in Him, and believing means more than just accepting the truth in your head. That means putting your trust in Him that should not perish. That means die that second death, but have everlasting life, eternal life with Him forever in heaven. God loves you. He doesn't want you to collect that second death. He said, I've got a solution for your problem. It's Jesus. And it also tells us that He proved His love for us. It's not just that he said it, he proved it in Romans 5, 8. He proved his love for us, and the King James used the word commendeth, and that does mean proved. He proved his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, what happened? Christ died on the cross for us. You want to see if God loves you? Go look at Jesus on the cross, dying. Horrible death. God says, that's how much I love you. I'm willing to sacrifice my only son for you. 
I love you. The next truth is, there is eternal life, and it comes as God's gift. A moment ago, we looked at Romans 6, 23, the first half of that verse where it says, the wages of sin is death, and I love this verse because right in the middle of that verse, it says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God says, here's what you've earned, but here's what I'm offering you. I want to give you a free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You want our eternal life? You just simply need Jesus. The fifth point I want to share with you is that eternal life is intricately interwoven with the Lord Jesus. You cannot separate the two. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 says, And this is the record that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. You want to find eternal life for yourself, you've got to look to Jesus. And look at the next verse. He that has the Son has life, and he hath not the Son of God hath not life. Listen, you either have Jesus and eternal life, or you've got neither one. You can have both, but you can't have one without the other. Some people say, oh, I want eternal life. You say, well, what are you going to do with Jesus? Well, I don't want anything to do with Jesus. You know, people are going to expect me to be a Christian, act like a Christian, walk like a Christian, talk like a Christian. I don't want anything to do with Jesus. Just give me eternal life. God says it doesn't work that way. You want the eternal life that I'm offering you? You need my son that I'm offering you. I offered him 2,000 years ago for you. So since God says it's a gift, what do you do with the gift that's offered? Receive or reject. That's it. God's offering His Son to you and eternal life to you, and you can either receive both or say, no, I don't want either one. Or I may want one without the other, and God says, no, you don't get one without the other. Are you willing to... Receive Jesus as your saving Lord and give yourself to Him as we sang about in those songs this morning. I give myself to you. Yeah, that's when He becomes the Lord of your life. Even though we're all sinners deserving the death and hell, we can all be forgiven and have eternal life. We can. I want you to take a look at this real quick up here. Here's what we, you and I, must do. We must begin by believing. There it is, up there yet. Yeah, it'll be there in a minute. Are you ready? There you go. Believe God's Word. What did we just share with you a moment ago? These scriptures. That's God's Word. Believe what God says about being a sinner. Believe what it says about God loving you. Believe what He says, I've got a gift of eternal life for you. And if you don't have that, you're going to collect a death penalty, both kinds. First death and second death. Believe what God's Word says. And when you believe it, say, I'm in trouble. I need to repent. I need to change my thinking. I need to change my actions, the way I live. I need to change the way I walk and talk. I need to repent. I, I, wanna, I need to turn away from sin and turn to God. And that's what repenting is. So you believe His Word enough to say, I'm willing to make a change and allow God to change me, even though I can't make all the changes on my own. So when you repent, you receive Jesus. God's Son is your Savior. See, until that moment in time, you haven't received Him. You've been trying to get through life on your own without Him. You're trying to do the best you can without Him. No, He said, receive my Son as your Savior and Lord as you repent of your sins. When you do that, eternal life will be yours. It's just that simple. It's not complicated. It's just one, two, three. God said, you, you, you need to believe what I'm telling you and, and repent of your sins and receive my son. And when you do that, you'll have eternal life. We remember what we read just a moment ago? If you have the son, you have eternal life. If you don't have the son, you don't have eternal life. So what do you need to do? Believe what God says. Repent of your sins. And receive Jesus. So let me ask you this question. It, it, anybody not understand that? Um, to me, it's so simple. I hope it's simple to you too. Anybody not understand this? All right, well, I'm going to ask you to do this. Do you believe what we're just talking about is true? If you, this is the gospel message, the Word of God. If you believe that is true, I'm going to ask you to do something. Just hold your hand up. So if you believe it, all over the building, I believe it all. I mean, you may say, I'm holding my hand up because people are looking at me and I'm going to be the only one without my hand up. Be honest, hold your hand up, keep it up. 
Keep it up for just a minute. Now then, if you are believing, the next question is, are you trusting Jesus? Are you trusting Him or are you just believing the information that you're reading? Now, if you're trusting Jesus to be your Savior, I'm going to ask you to do this. Let's stand. You don't have to stand because everybody else is, but it's got to be true for you. If you're trusting Jesus as your Savior, stand up. Fantastic. All over the building. And I'm trusting that there's people in the fellowship hall and in their parking lot. I don't know if they're standing up beside their cars or not, but they're responding somehow. And we know there's people there trusting Jesus. You're standing up saying, I'm trusting Him. I'm trusting Him to give me eternal life. I'm trusting Him to take me to heaven when I die. I'm trusting Jesus as my Savior. Now then, the next question is, if right now, today, is the first time you have really started trusting Him, I'm going to ask you to do something. Come down here with me. Anybody here? This is the first time. You've never done it before, but you know, say, I know this is what I need to do, so I'm going to trust Jesus right now. While everybody's standing, would you come down here with me? Anybody? One, two, three, a dozen of you? It's okay. Hey, if half the church comes, come on. I've never trusted Jesus before, but I am now, today. And I'm not ashamed of Him. I'm grateful for what He's done for me. Anybody want to stand? I'm just going to ask you to come sit down in the front rows. I'm going to ask you to do. I'm not going to ask you to preach a sermon or sing or anything like that. I'm trusting Jesus for the first time. Anybody? God bless you. So what you're telling me by standing, you're saying I have been trusting Jesus before today. That may have been beginning last night or last week or 20 years ago. You're making a public statement of your faith in Christ. And you know that's exactly what he tells us to do. He said, if you'll confess me before men, and which is what you're doing, he said, I'll confess you before my Father which is in heaven. Isn't that wonderful? God bless you. Be seated, please. Please be seated. Everybody who is truly trusting Jesus as their Savior and the Lord is worthy to worship Him with this. Okay? As I mentioned earlier, if you're not really trusting Him as your Savior and your Lord, don't, don't open this. But if you are, you're worthy to worship Him because you understand the price that He paid for you. You're worthy to worship Him for what he endured in his body for you and me. I want to tell you about that. I want to share a little bit of that with you. Forgive me, sometimes I get kind of choked up when I think about the details of what happened to Jesus when they captured him. Not that he was running and hiding. He was not. He was in the garden of Gethsemane praying. And they came and the soldiers took him away. They bound him. They tortured him. Some of the soldiers slapped him with their open hands. That's a big insult. Others covered his face with a hood and blindfold and they began to hit him with their fist again and again. They said, oh, you're a prophet. You can't see. Who hit you that time, prophet? Tell us. You're really a prophet. Who about this guy? How about, how'd that feel? Again and again. They beat him in his face until he was so bloody he no longer looked human anymore. And then they did something else. Tradition says that the Jews did this. Of course, the Bible talks about the Romans using a scourging whip. I happen to have one. As a matter of fact, I happen to have two. I want you to see the reality of what Jesus endured for you. After they beat him in the face and even ripped the beard out of his face, the released, for we know for sure from biblical records, the Romans used this across his back again and again. If you'll look at this carefully, some of y'all can see, it's just leather. Would it hurt? Would it bring a whelp? Would it rip your flesh? Nothing compared to this one. The Romans often used scourging whips like this, and you can see, well, this one's kind of tangled, but you can see some lead balls that they would tie on some of them to bruise the flesh, to bring blood to the surface. And then they would use the second whip or the third they would have sharp metal barbs, pieces of metal 
or pottery tied to it, to actually shred the back, to tear the flesh off of an individual's back completely. And that's what Jesus endured again and again. The Jews had a law. Forty lashes is the maximum. They always stopped with 39. They didn't want to break their own law, even though they were beating a man half to death. The Romans didn't have such a law. The Romans had a man called the lictor. He was a professional at using these. He would take that whip and he would use it. He would lash it again and again and again, watching what was happening to the man he was beating. How close to death can I bring him before I stop? That was his goal. That was his job. If he killed the man, he was in trouble. But if he didn't beat him enough, he was in trouble. Can I tell you, Jesus endured the scourging whip in his body. He endured that. And then after that, they really wanted to mock him, so they had a crown of thorns. I'm not going to do it, Butch, but... Can you imagine having that shoved into your scalp? After your face has been beaten, after your back has been shredded, you're bleeding, and shoving that into a man's forehead and in his scalp, and the blood poured down. We know that beyond that, they took him to Calvary, to the cross. And on the cross, they nailed him. Driving nails into his hands as they were stretched out on the boards and into the other hand. And in his feet, they drove the other nail. And while he stretched out on the ground on the cross, after enduring all of that, they raised the cross up and let it drop into a hole. And he's hanging by the three nails. Why he didn't die right then is only by the grace of God. It was God's plan for him not to die right then. It was God's plan for him to keep living in spite of all of that. People that you see pictures of Jesus, they look kind of soft and wimpy. He wasn't. He was a tough, strong man to endure that. He didn't die when they first hung him up there. Many a man died at the whipping. Many a man died on the way to the cross. Many of the man died when they first hung him up. Jesus didn't die after the first hour, the second hour, the third hour, the fourth hour, the fifth hour. Six hours he hung up there like that in the hot desert sun. We worship him for what he endured in his body. I cannot imagine it other than I've read it and studied it and say, Lord, how could you do that? And if he could answer us right now and you could ask him, Jesus, how could you do that? He'd say, because I love you. All that punishment I got, it was yours. I was stepping between you and the wrath of Almighty Holy God. And I took it. And while he was hanging on that cross, before he died, during that six hours, there's several things that he said, but the two that come to my mind, first of all, is he looked out to the people that were standing around the cross. Some of them had mocked him. Some of them had spit on him. They had called him all kinds of names. Some of them were the soldiers that had driven the nails into his hands and his feet. And he looked up to his father and he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And finally... He said, it's finished. He had done everything that he came from heaven to earth to do. It's finished. He paid the price in full. And when he died, he took our punishment. The first death and the second. Right there. We worship Jesus for what he endured in his body, but we also worship him for shedding his blood. And you say, oh, you just told us all that terrible stuff. Yeah, but you need to understand the blood. 
See, it actually began the night before in the Garden of Gethsemane, before they came and captured him. He was praying, and the Bible says he was in such agony over what he knew was coming. He knew what was going to happen that night. He knew what was going to happen the next morning. He knew about the six hours on the cross. He knew about everything, how horrible it was going to be. He knew about the mockery. He knew about the cursing. He knew about the people spitting on him. He knew about the crown of thorns. He knew about everything. And he said, oh, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But if there's no other way except I drink it, not my will, but thine be done. Aren't you glad he prayed that? Aren't you glad? Sweat as it were. He was in such agony. His blood pressure got so high. He was literally oozing blood out of his pores. And of course, from all of those other wounds that he had, the battering of his faith, he was bleeding, the crown of thorns, the shredded back, the nails in his hands and his feet. He was bloody. It was coming out of his body. He was drenched in his own blood. And it was running down the cross and drenching even the ground. And you say, well, why? What's the big deal about his blood? Oh, I hope you get this. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, Unto him that loved us, that's Jesus, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. When you saw Amber baptized a moment ago, that water didn't wash away one sin. It's impossible. Jesus washes away our sins in His own blood that He did not allow to stay in His body which went into the grave. No, He poured it out so that He could wash us in His own blood. How good a job does it do? did He do? Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. It doesn't matter how bright your sins are, how noticeable they are, how terrible they are. When Jesus washes you in His own blood, He washes them all away. He also washes the sin record away too. It's erased by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's why in a moment and when we drink the cup, we're going to be thanking Him for His blood because there's no other way for us to be cleansed. But God has provided the one way. It's Jesus in His blood. Oh my. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that when I was a little boy, somebody told me some of this stuff. And while I didn't understand it all, I understood it enough to know that I needed to be forgiven. I needed to have my sins washed away. And I knew that I needed to trust Jesus as my Savior. And I prayed as a little boy, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, come into my heart and save me. Wash me, make me clean. Can I tell you, He did it? He did it. Have you been washed? You know whether you have or not. I mean, you can be like a little child at your mama's house and she said, Honey, did you take a bath tonight? You can lie. But mama usually can tell. It's either true or it's not, is it? Have you been washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? Has He made you clean? Oh, if not, I pray you will. You stood a moment ago saying you were trusting Jesus. You trust Him enough to ask Him to cleanse you? And you know that you're not, without His cleansing, you're not going to be clean enough to come through heaven's gates? Maybe you need to ask Him to do it right now. Again, maybe you're not sure. Don't be guessing at this. You need to know for certain. And we're going to give you a chance to do that. I want to invite you to do that. Because you see, until you have been washed in the blood... You're not worthy to worship Him with the Lord's Supper. Not really. So if you're not certain He has washed you and made you clean, He's washed away the record of your sins and cleansed you, made you white as snow, here's your chance. Here's your chance. And you can either come to this altar and pray and repent and ask Him to wash away your sins, or if you can say, well, look, I know I'm saved, but I've got to be honest with you. Dear God, I, I, I want to partake of this, but God, you've been convicting me of my sins in my life. I'm a Christian, but I've got sin in my life. I've been rebelling against you. You've been telling me, Alan, you need to improve this. You need to get rid of that. You need to start this. And I've been struggling against God. If that's you, here's a chance to get right before we worship the Lord.
with the bread and with the cup. So I'm going to ask you to do that. If, if, if you want to come down here and kneel in the front, you come on. But if not, you just stay where you are. Repent of every sin that God's bringing to your mind right now. Lord, show me what I need to get rid of. Lord, show me what I need to do to be worthy to worship your son, Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me? Would you come forward, anybody? If this is what God's telling you to do, we well, can come right down here. We're not going to be in a hurry. We're not worried about this. We just want to be right with God. I'm a Christian, but, oh God, I've been saying no to you. I've been wanting my way and not your way. Forgive me. Maybe the Lord's telling you, you've got some habits you need to get rid of. This is a good time to do it. Lord, help me. Take away these bad habits so that I can be worthy to worship your son who suffered so much for me. Maybe the Lord's telling you, you need to start a new habit. You need to be reading that Bible every day. You need to be in church every Sunday, every opportunity. You need to worship with your brothers and sisters and not find somebody something else to do. Is God telling you that? Well, now's the time to make that commitment to the Lord. We need to repent to be ready and worthy. I'd be happy to pray with anybody who would like for me to. Just come on. I'm here. Be happy to pray with you. Oh, Father, cleanse us right now. Cleanse our hearts, dear God. Help us to see the sin that's in our lives the way you see it that we might totally repent, completely be forgiven and cleansed. Oh, Father, that we might be able to truly worship Jesus in just a moment by partaking of the bread and drinking of the juice, the bread representing his body, the juice representing his blood. Oh, Father, please cleanse my heart, dear God, as well as these, my brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.